Everybody joining me right now is a guy who really doesn't need any introduction, but for those of you who don't know, it's Rahul, Alt Investors Hangout. Rahul, how are you? Don, long time no talk. What's happening? Have you lived in Chicago your whole life? I was uh, born and raised in Park Ridge, and Park Ridge is actually the suburb where, uh, what's her name, Crooked Hillary uh, was born and raised in. And yeah, so I've <laughs> lived in Chicagoland all my life. So your first name is Rahul. Yep. A lot of people misspell that, don't they? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, what happens is in school, right, sometimes they used to call me Rahul, right, the Hispanic uh, version of it, R-A-U-L. Um, sometimes people used to call me Ragu, R-A-G-U. Um, some uh, Ethiopian guy in high school, uh, he was born, I think, in the U.S. Um, he called me Rahizel. I, I really like that name. I like Ra I, I do like Rahizel, but Ra Ragu, I don't like that one. I don't, I don't yeah, Ra Ragu doesn't sound too appealing. I, I like Rahizel. Hmm. That, that's a good name. Where Where is your family from? Uh, we're from India. Um, yeah, it is a weird story how we came about to America. My grandpa came here in the late 1960s with my uncle. Uh, he had a medical condition. The hospitals in, in India weren't so good. They were under a socialist uh, type of government aligned with the Soviet Union. So he came. they came then, and then my dad sh finished his studies in India, and then he came, I think, like 10 years later, and then, yeah, now, got married, and then I came about. You, uh, you've you mentioned to me before that you, you have gone back to India? You visited? Yeah, I, yeah, I visited in 1998. So what? That was twenty years what, ago. Twenty years ago, yeah. Like my wife and I were trying to plan a vacation there, and the weird thing is, my wife, she only went there when she was like one or two years old, just to visit. So we're trying to plan something next year. Do you? D does your family have a, kind of a strong cultural tie back to India? Well, like my parents, they definitely do. Uh, my wife's parents, I, they definitely do. Uh, my wife, even though she's born here, she's like a lot more Indian than like some of the people just coming from India, which which is the most bizarre thing. But in terms of culture, um, like she likes Bollywood movies and all that. But in terms of me, I'm really not into all of that. I mean, I'll go to see uh, Hindi movies, Bollywood movies with her. I, I'll eat the food. But in terms of like, me having a strong attachment to India. I know some people in her family wouldn't like to say it, but I'm not really tied into that culture or into my culture as much as I would say that her side of the family. Um, you and I have talked in the past about stereotypes, and you talked about growing up in Chicago, and I've heard the story about the guy that called you Ragu before, and I heard about the Rahizel and all that. Were there any stereotypes that you felt you had to overcome in some way uh, here in America? Well, when you're young, uh, people may say, may call you names, and uh, at that time, right, it affects you, but then as you grow older, it, it doesn't really matter because we're all mature by this age, and um, we, we're better, uh, how should I say, we have better relationships than we did when we we're younger, right? I mean, people say stupid things when they're younger. And once you become adults, right, uh, people are a lot more mature. So when I was younger, sure, it affected me. Uh, I may have been insulted by some of the things they may have said, but right now, it's like, it has no impact on me. Tell me, is it true that India is not the same north and south, right? It's, these are hundreds of different dialects, different languages, different cultures. Is that correct? Oh, yeah, for sure. India has, I would say, a group of different people, a group of different tribes, and there's different languages, there's different religions. There's also some people still even believe in the caste system, which I don't agree with, but you have all sorts of uh, people living there, and people talk about multiculturalism like uh, affecting the West. I would say that multiculturalism actually affects India, and not many people realize it. I don't think it's as bad as it was uh, 30 years ago, because you know now you have uh, the economy improving over the last what 30 years. So, but besides that, like in smaller towns, yeah, you do still see stories of that you hear 
or if in the news it'll, it'll talk about it so it, it's still there um there's also a lot of prejudice among different groups of indians uh, a lot of white people may not understand or a lot of people who aren't indian may not know that but um, there's just a lot of not tension between other groups of indians but for instance like uh, my wife's Gujarati. I, I don't know if you know that, right? Gujarati basically is a person from the part of India called Gujarat. And uh, my wife's family is from there. And they are very tribalistic uh, in their ways, right? Um, I actually was bullied by Gujaratis uh, growing up. And even in college, they were very mean to me. Why? Um, what, what, why? Why would they be rude? What? What is it? Uh, uh, because uh, I mean, for instance, like uh, you know me, right? I talk to different groups of people. I, I don't. I'm not like the stereotypical Indian dude that only hangs out with Indians. A lot of Indian people that I know, growing up, they hang out in their own crowd. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it's just what I've noticed. And in the college campus, I noticed that for sure. And when I was in college, I spoke to and hung out with different groups of people. Um, some of them happened to be white, right? And I didn't hang out with that group of Indian people, the Gujaratis, some of those guys. And they used to give me uh, a lot of heat for hanging out with uh, like white girls or uh, just white dudes, right? Because we used to like wa we used to watch baseball. I mean, I love the Cubs. So we used to just do stuff like that. And I, I used to hear some of that stuff coming back to me i'm thinking to myself like what are we 10 years old 12 years old well, and well, well hold on what, what's amazing to me about what you've told me is it seems like if, if if that's the case then how could you win in a culture that may have stereotypes about a guy from india in the first place and so you it seems like you may have to overcome that and you got to overcome from your own culture or a subculture so you're getting it from both ends that sounds kind of unpleasant Growing up, it was uncomfortable. Um, right now, it, like I said, it doesn't matter, right? Because I'm older, and I don't know. Well, I don't. Yeah. Well, hold on. I don't know if, yeah. it, if I don't. I mean, I don't know that if you're older, it's any better. In fact, if you look around the country right now, I, I don't think we've ever been more divided than we are. And it, it seems to be these day, these days all on these tribalistic lines, and race and ethnicity seem to be really important to a lot of people. So. Adults across the board these days seem to be more caught up in that than ever. So, is it, it from your perspective? How do you view what's happening in the country right now? A lot of people they had these views um, around regarding different races and political characterizations of individuals, but they kept it on the DL uh, because of Donald Trump. Right? He actually brought these issues to the forefront. Whether people agree with him or not, that doesn't matter. These issues were always there. And what has uh, created a conflagration of this issue is, in my opinion, uh, you've had ultra left-wing groups, in my opinion, dominated by Soros, who have uh, created this tension between, um, I would say, not the hard right, but like center right, and then you go a little further right, and then you got the hard left. The hard left, in my opinion, is going crazy, even though in some ways they do have legitimate issues regards to uh, maybe uh, drug wars and the mandatory minimums that Hillary Clinton set forth, but they're creating a lot of tension where there shouldn't be a lot of tension. Like uh, we, we knew all the cases that uh, the media covered, right, with Trayvon Martin and so forth, right? That case was promoted by the mainstream media where we didn't know who was at fault, but they were saying that it was the fault of uh, white people and white supremacy. But then if you look at the story in general, uh, the guy Zimmerman was half uh, Latino and he wasn't a full-blown um, white person. So when you see the media and the left-wing groups trying to promote st stories where there may have been a case of racism, but it's not 100% uh, true that there was racism involved, it's going to create tension. And with the media went on that road. I think that was the turning point, and which has led to this civil war that Michael Savage has talked about. He even wrote a book, The Coming Civil War. And it all, to me, it all seems radically unnecessary. I 
I, I, I'm frustrated because I don't judge anybody by the color of their skin. I don't judge anybody by their ethnicity, where they come from. It, it just baffles me why people are so caught up in that stuff. I have no idea why anybody cares about that. And I, it, I, I think it's because um, they may have had an issue with a person of a different background and it has affected them throughout their own lives and they never got rid of that and then when you see donald trump right um, bringing these issues to the forefront um yeah you're definitely going to see tension and then these uh, ultra left-wing groups uh want to create tension uh, this is what you hit and the media is very dishonest <laughs> what is something that you hear every now and then you go, man, I wish people wouldn't say that. It just, it, whatever, it might bug you. It might be they don't know what they're talking about. Is there something people say that just gets under your skin? It's not it gets under my skin. So whenever I hear people say, man, that, that dude smells like curry or it smells like curry, it's not curry. It's masala. Oh, like, oh wait, 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 hold on. Wait, yeah. wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I mean, wait, at no, least no, get it hold, right. No. Say, like, it smells like masala, stop, man. Wait, no, wait, wait, stop. You're, yeah. You, hold on. You're telling me you actually hear people, and I'm not being funny about this. Are, yeah, you, yeah. are you being funny? You, people actually will say, that dude smells like curry? No, I'll read comments online, right? Like, I, I you know, I understand the spices uh, have a stench. I get it, but it's not curry. It's masala. And if people say, "Man, it smells like masala," I'd be like, "Yeah, I totally agree." At least get it right. Oh no, that wait, 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 no, when that is totally unacceptable. Every, anyone listening to me right now, that is unacceptable. You do not say someone smells like something. That is not acceptable. No. No, no I mean, like, I I don't care, right? Like, I'd rather hear people what they think rather than what they don't think, because you know. That's I don't like fakeness, for instance. Well, right? okay, no, right. I mean, I get you about yeah, yeah, that, but yeah. when, I'm not asking what but, you accept. I'm asking something yeah. you don't want to hear anymore. And that yeah. is a that is raw. I mean, I can't even imagine someone saying that. Like uh, that guy, you know, smells like some spice. I mean, that's just wow. Did you, did you get your political or your social views or your views on money or anything like that from family members? Because you're a pretty conservative guy. Is that something that you grew up with, or is it something that you've grown into? I've actually grown into. Um, my parents were, at the time, Clinton supporters because, you know, like the stock market was on fire, home prices went up and all that. But then as I started to get older, um, this was like in college, um, I was like a socialist at that time. But then, I mean... A lot of Indians tend to be left-wing, but I could get into that in a, later in this conversation. Um, I saw a lot of these guys in college, right? And there was no way I, I agreed with what they thought. And I didn't like them whatsoever. And they're like hardcore leftists. So I'm like, you know what? I, I don't like these guys. And then uh, there's this uh, one guy, uh, Dinesh D'Souza. But he came to my alma mater, uh, Loyola. And... And I said, like, wait a second, this guy's name is Dinesh D'Souza, and he's not a white guy, and he's speaking on behalf of the Republican Party uh, at Loyola. So I'm like, okay, let me, let me read one of his books. It was called The End of Racism. So this was like 2005-ish, right? But this book was written in 1996. And uh, this was just a book uh, just explaining how, you know, Pretty much pull yourself up from the bootstraps. Yeah, um, every culture you may be called names, but that shouldn't stop you from becoming a successful individual, right? Uh, look at the Jews, for instance, right? They were discriminated in the 1800s, right? They created their own firms, Goldman Sachs and whatnot, and they became very successful in America. So that that's what he was trying to say for those com still complaining about old uh, policies of America. So after I read that book, I started to read uh, other individuals like Thomas Sowell, and that's when I started to be like, okay, th this is what I believe in conservatism. But then I had mixed feelings about George Bush and the war. I really didn't uh, like that. But then I got into Ron Paul and then Peter Schiff, right? Uh, they were talking about free markets. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm all about that. But then they were anti-war. I'm like, yeah, that, that's totally me. Right, right. Okay, yeah. so so on D D Dinesh D'Souza, you yeah. know, it's interesting how you mentioned 
the color of his skin or his ethnicity yeah, or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, at that time, I mean, like, I'm like, hey, wait. This, at that time, I was turned off by Republicans because of Bush and, you know, uh, growing up in uh, my uh, culture, right, in America, right? A lot of Indians at that time were Democrats, right? Well, Gr- it, Growing up in that community. So well, I'm like, okay, I mean, that makes sense. Well, it's, fa- it's fascinating the way you look at that because for me, the first time I saw Dinesh D'Souza, I... I didn't. I didn't see anything at all in terms of color. I, it, it did not impress right. me where he came from. What, impre- right. what impressed me was what he had to say. Yeah, the only thing about D'Souza was like he was uh, all about Bush and like the neocons back then. And now he's sort of like, oh yeah, Trump is great. Yeah, we're talking with Russia. Maybe a decade ago he would have said that. Hey, that, that's okay. Uh, now I didn't get. Yeah, I didn't start getting into D'Souza until the last yeah. four or five years. And. But like like you're saying about D'Souza, the the bottom line is is his skin color for me didn't matter. But I'm fascinated that it, you brought that up. That's the very first thing you talked about. <laughs> yeah, it, it's like I'm not gonna hide the fact. I mean, I was in college, right? At that time, when I saw like conservatives, like they were. This is just my view in 2005, right? Like very angry, um, middle of the age uh, individuals, elitist, right? And then. I saw, wait, there's an Indian guy who's Republican, and he's speaking at my college. I'm like, well, what's going on here? This is just my thought process. I'm like, okay, you know what? L- let me let me just read his book. And because I, I sort of getting turned off by liberals, right, the crazy leftists. So, and then after I read his book, I'm like, whoa, this is really interesting. Then I got into Thomas Sowell, but then over the years, I was like, you know what? Um... There's something wrong with the Republican Party. Okay, but and then well, yeah. hold on, hold on, because if 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 Dinesh D'Souza got you thinking, what about Bobby Jindal? And check this out, governor from the state of Louisiana, the the state that gets the most guff, maybe Mississippi or Alabama get, I don't know, but but Louisiana, you know where I'm from, gets a lot of guff for being racist, and Bobby Jindal was the governor, and a, yeah. a guy a guy educated at. Oxford and Brown? Wow. I mean, so <laughs> I wonder what your take is on Jindal. I mean, when I was younger, this was like, what, eight, nine years ago, I was like, yeah, Bobby Jindal, right? We, we have like the first Indian governor who's not a Democrat in the South. I think that's fantastic. But then over the years, right, he's, uh, I, I do agree with some of the things with that he says, like a limited government, but then he's like uh, going after Trump, right? He's like one of those never Trumpers. And even though I disagree with Trump, I'm still aligned with him when it comes to like, you know, uh, meeting with Kim, right? I, I think that's a good step in trying to have better relationship with a nuclear armed country or with the country that wants to have nuclear weapons, right? He wants to defuse tensions. Trump was against the Iraq war. He wants to get out of uh, NAFTA and GAD or not GAD, but like, you know, these bogus free trade agreements, which aren't free trade. So there's a lot of things that Trump says that I agree with, right? Uh, there are some definite criticisms I have of Trump, but he's one of the few Republicans that I actually can say, yeah, I, I support. There's also Nikki Haley, Indian governor in, uh, or previously Indian governor in South Carolina. I think that her neoconservative views, after I learned more about neoconservatism and the cancer it is, I, I, I hate her when it comes to foreign policy. Okay, with, with respect to Trump, first of all, I didn't vote yeah. for Trump. And uh, I also didn't vote for Hillary Clinton. And look, if I had to choose between him and Clinton, if my vote was the one that was going to change things, I guess I'd hold my, my nose and vote for Trump on principle alone there. But he's not exactly the moral leader you'd like. And, and I would say this for anyone who disagrees with me. He's my president, too. I support him. Look, uh, what he's doing with North Korea, I think it's fantastic. Um, I think his Supreme Court justice nominees are going to be better than anything Clinton ever could have come up with. And I get all that. But here's my thing. Were there not two people that were better for what the country needed than Clinton and Trump? That's all I'm saying. I would have preferred Rand Paul to be the Republican nominee for the president, but he didn't win. So it was uh, Cruz. It was Trump. Uh, Gary Johnson didn't have a chance as a libertarian candidate. And it was Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton, in my opinion, would have set U.S. and Russia relationships down the drain. And I would have been scared. Um, you know, we could have been at each other's throats like in the 1950s, right? I find it interesting 
that just because you know you know you 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 come from a a you know say an Indian background, I got a guy on the phone with me right now who's got a guy from India, and you're not you're not digging them just because they're you got Indian heritage. <laughs> you know you don't know it's important because in America today it seems like. If you don't get behind your exact race and your ethnicity, then you're a traitor. You're a turncoat. And you thought it was interesting that Dinesh D'Souza was Indian, and I guess Jindal and Haley as well. But that's not why you'd vote for them. Yeah, th this was when I was younger when I told you about D'Souza. So I was like, okay, uh, me with that young mindset, uh, naive, I was like, hey, l let me look at this uh, Indian guy who's conservative, right? Because you don't see this that often, right? Uh, in my mind, I, I just noticed a lot of individuals that were um, white and a few African Americans in the Republican Party at that time. But then I started to let, look less at race and look more at uh, principles, right? And I got into libertarianism. And then I saw, like, uh, Nikki Haley, for instance, right? Uh, she had she wanted an aggressive policy towards Russia. Trump said, "Hell no, we're not going to do that." What you want to do at the UN? And after I looked at her record, I'm like, "Hell no, I can't support her if she runs for president one day." But putting that aside, uh, you made an interesting point. You know, if a person of your race runs, right? People say, "Hey, you're probably going to support her because of that." Well, I found uh, some interesting comments from my cousin's relatives, and they told me that. You know, uh, not me saying this, but they said that, you know, Bobby Jindal is like so whitewashed or blah, 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 blah. And, and Nikki Haley, and, like some terms for her, you know, because she converted to what Catholicism from Sikhism or something like that. So a, a lot of Indians that I see, um, like that I notice on social media, they make uh, these comments that, oh, she converted, she's a wannabe or he's whitewashed or blah, 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 blah. So... I would say that if uh, Nikki Haley were to run, I would see those same comments from some Indian people saying that, you know what, she converted. I'm not going to vote for her. That that is fascinating. Yeah. So, but what I what I also think is fascinating is I don't, and and maybe I just don't see something, but I don't know anybody personally who looks at skin color or ethnicity at all and and decides that's how I'm going to vote for anything. I just don't know these people. They must exist because George Soros tells me they're everywhere. <laughs> I mean, they must be out there. But I have been very happy that of I mean it seems like the media portrays our country as the most divided it's ever been and on the on the surface it looks that way, but underneath I am finding way more people having things in common across all religions and all ethnicities, all races. I'm seeing a much tighter bond when you get below what the media tells you. Now, do you see the same thing where you're coming from? I, I see it a lot better. Um than what the media is talking about. Um, I think the media is very toxic, obviously, to our society. Um, when I was talking to one African-American guy who was my friend a few years ago, um, we don't talk anymore, but during that time of Trayvon Martin, for instance, right? And I noticed that uh, he was like really into it. Like he thought that, you know, Trayvon was innocent and blah 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 and my other friend asked me who was Indian he asked me what did I think of it and we're in a like a group chat and I said like the media wants to create a race war right, and yes. I'm not going to back down from that statement and my African-American friend or old African-American friend he flipped out on me he wasn't like cursing or anything like that he's just like how could you say that blah 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 and uh, he was he got very emotional and I was surprised and before, like, this Trayvon Martin stuff that the media hyped up, everything was fine. And uh, as long as we don't talk about these issues, I think um, I don't see that much tension. It's just like when you open your mouth and make a comment about it, like, uh, people get, like, really tribalistic. Yeah, That's the it, only yeah. thing. Yeah. Like, we, we could talk about sports. We could talk about, I don't know, hobbies. We could watch the game, but... Well, Once you bring up these issues, it's like the media has uh, poisoned people's minds. When your race or your ethnic group is the, is the dominant race or ethnic group, I think it's very easy to fall into the idea that there's no problems. And I think I would be a complete idiot to say, well, there's no, no racism in America. It never happens. Of course it does. And I think, again, I alluded to, alluded to this earlier, where anywhere you go, the predominant culture is going to – there's going to be a, a disparity somewhere. I, I totally get that. But – 
I also believe that the media, like you're saying, really gins things up in such a way to make it look way more overblown than it has to be. I'm not saying there aren't problems. I'm just saying, but, but I, again, I see, like, when I go through my daily life, I just don't see the sort of racism the media portrays. And I don't think it's really there. I think Americans, if they would turn off the news, quote the news, fake or otherwise, and just start talking to each other like people, I know this sounds ridiculous and it's all Pollyanna and maybe I'm being super naive. I just think if people will start talking to each other, not from the top down, but from the bottom up, people reaching across and meeting people where they're at. And again, that sounds super naive. Um, and, and maybe I'm an idiot and maybe you know, the race war is going to happen anyway. But I'll be on my front porch sad if it does happen. Will you join me on my front porch sad, Rahul? Oh, I definitely would be sad. And, but the reality is the way that it's going it's bound to happen. Rahul, I really appreciate appreciate you coming on. Um, you're a fascinating guy, and everybody can check out what you do. You talk about money, you talk about markets, and gold and silver and liberty and freedom and all that. But I, I really wanted to pick your brain on some of these social issues because I know you have an interesting story. I know you're, I, I know a little bit about your background, and I really appreciate you coming on and sharing that stuff with us. Maybe next time you can come on, we'll talk about gold and silver or whatever. Is there something that you want to talk about before we leave that, that you want to make sure people know about? Well, uh, one thing to note is uh, you're seeing the media, t- it, it, this is about the stock market in general, uh, you see a lot of headlines about the yield curve, right? And uh, the yield curve is a good indicator for showing a recession, but I'm seeing a lot of the media talking about the yield curve, yield, co- yield curve, recession, 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 and the alternative media is also picking that up. And now that I'm seeing it more and more and more, I did some uh, research, not research, I did some digging. Like I looked at the Fed funds rate versus the 10-year because everyone looks at the two-year and the 10-year, right? And they say, hey, it's narrowing, it's narrowing. But if you look at the Fed funds rate versus the 10-year, which is another measure of the yield curve, that's actually 100 basis points spread. So that's a lot larger than the twos and the tens. So if you look at the last few recessions, the Fed funds rate was greater than the 10-year. So uh, just... uh, Look at that before saying, hey, market's in trouble, yield curve uh, is inverting or narrowing. We you still have a little more time before the okay, big bonanza. So, okay, so, so just to be clear, you're saying that the federal funds target rate right now, which is what, like two, one and a half, where, where's that right 1. now? 1.75. 1.75. Look at, you look at that. I said two, one and a half. It's right in the middle. It's amazing. So yeah. 1.75, and you're saying that that – is larger than the spread between the 10 and the 2. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, which is like 25 basis points. Right. So what you're saying is, uh, well, well, before me, I won't tell you what you're saying. Why don't you explain to the layperson why you think that's significant? Well, the thing is that, uh, number one, uh, the yield curve shows that, okay, as, as long as it's upward sloping, the economy is going well because uh, banks, uh, they lend money, uh, that's usually illiquid long-term securities. And as long as it's upward sloping yield curve, the economy is doing fine. Once it inverts, you start to have problems. But then um, a lot of people, are they look at the two and the 10-year, which is one way of looking at it. And they're saying that, hey, that, that's narrowing. But you have to look at another big picture, and that's the Fed funds rate, which is uh, the rate that banks lend to other banks, right? So if that rate right now, the Fed funds rate versus the 10-year, it has 100 uh, basis points spread, uh, it, that means that the economic activity should be all right. That doesn't mean that we're going to have problems in the next uh, year, year and a half. I do still expect a recession coming by the time Trump leaves. But it just means that right now, as of this moment, we still have time for this bull market and yeah. economic growth to continue to go higher. Doesn't it also say, and again, you are way more well-versed in this stuff than I am. You, you, you are an accountant. I'm just some guy with a microphone. So if I'm wrong about this, it's because I'm dumb and you're smart. But doesn't this say that the economy can't be overheating, or, or at least certainly the Fed doesn't think the economy is overheating anywhere near that? I mean, if, if you're saying the two-year and the 10-year, if they're as low as they are, and the spread between the federal funds target rate short term and where we are long term is so disparate. Does that, not, does that not indicate to you that they don't think we're anywhere near overheating? If that's the case, then the market could. I mean, maybe what they were talking about 20 years ago, remember those books like Dow 80,000 and all that? 
I mean, it's possible, given that, that we could see in the near future, five, ten years, an explosion in the market. I wouldn't be surprised if you see an explosion in the market like you're saying. I, I'm just saying, like, in the next, like, six months per se. But, yeah, be, because of, uh, for instance, uh, the dynamic nature of our economy and also the n- fact that we have all this debt, right? So they're going to have to keep interest rates artificially low. So when you keep interest rates artificially low, right, that, that hot money is going to go into – uh, these Silicon Valley companies, it's going to go to Wall Street. So, yeah, we're going to see this party continue on. And it may not be 5, 10 years, but who knows, like 20, 25 years, we'll probably see Dow 80,000. Okay, so that, that, uh, if, I, if I misspoke in terms of the timing, I, I don't yeah. think in the six months Dow 80,000. I'm just saying that. Right, yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying. The, the, bank, the bankers do not see that where we are now is overheated. Where we are now, prices are too high. Where we are now, inflation's out of control. They don't see that right now. That, right now, they don't. But no. then, me being the conspiracy theorist as well, I think that the Federal Reserve, um, who are globalists, right? the powers that be, they would want to have instant impact. And when can they have instant impact? Right around the election time. So in my opinion, the Fed funds rate is going to overtake the 10-year right around when Trump is trying to go for re-election or he doesn't run again. One of those things in one and a half years. And that's going to spook the markets. You think that's Yes. Uh, yeah, that's going to okay. spook the markets. Okay. And we're going to hold you to that because, as you know, you're on YouTube. You can never, ever get something wrong. Ever. Oh, I've been wrong a lot. No, no don't admit it. You can't admit it. Everybody's Rahul. <laughs> Alt Investors hang out on YouTube. Uh, fast fact, since my last appearance on your channel, my, my video with you uh, has the most number of views since that time on your channel. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it has, right? I, I don't uh, talk about freaking uh, <laughs> silver at $1,000 an ounce. If I did that, man, I would be like a silver all-star. You know what? I might just title this video, Rahul Says Silver at $1,000 an ounce. Oh, no, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, everybody, it is Rahul again, Alt Investors Hangout. Thanks for being here, Rahul. Everybody, go check out his channel. And, Rahul, I will catch you on the flip side. All right, I see ya.